what's up you guys i am pam Rady, and thank you so much for choosing me today welcome to my channel so the case that i will be covering today is one that i've actually done before and to be honest this case is one that has stuck with me it's one of those that are just not so easy to shake off and now that i've read Handy Ratif's book Bailafelt, dossier of a serial sleuth i've honestly got a fresh perspective on this case and if you are a true crime fan i promise you this book is absolutely phenomenal i could not put this book down pete bailafelt was the investigator slash detective who handled this case the lee matthews case he cracked it after a task force of 150 policemen failed to do so so he is absolutely called for this kind of work he hated crime with a passion and that was his driving force to capture his clients as he would refer to his suspects he had the patience like no other and he would go as far as forming like a friendship with the particular suspect all in the name of getting that confession and it worked like a charm honestly i could go on and on about this man he was world renowned he had a 99 percent success rate like units from overseas used to come down to the brixton murder and robbery unit just to seek pete's advice that's how good he was honestly it's been a long time since i've admired anybody in that way and i honestly admire this man and the work that he had done so the book is based on some of the high profile south african true crime cases that he handled but let me stop there and let's jump right into this case Lee Matthews was born on the 8th of July 1983. She was a daughter to Sharon and Rob Matthews and she had a sister named Karen. She also happened to be a student at Bond University back in 2004, which coincidentally Bond University closed down in that year as well. She was studying towards a BCom in finance and had dreams of becoming a chartered accountant. This lovely family lived in the city of Four Ways in Johannesburg. Bob was an IT entrepreneur and it's not really mentioned as to what Sharon did but she was described to be a wonderful mom and a supportive wife. So fast forward to the 8th of July 2004. It is Lee's birthday. Family is celebrating at a Chinese restaurant in Cyril Dean with close friends plan was to celebrate Lee's actual birthday at this restaurant you know nice and intimate and then the big party the big 21st would be on the Saturday following Lee had planned her party to the T she had planned to have a Pirates of the Caribbean theme at the Vitz Club now Lee was described to be very gentle and like an angel she was just an all-round great girl she was a good kid she was a great student her friends described her to be you know just down to earth and even though her family was well off the girls Lee and Karen never ever flaunted their family's wealth just a key note Lee was also described to be very safety conscious like she was the one reminding everyone to lock the doors make sure your car doors are locked back to the restaurant dinner birthday dinner her parents had gifted her with a tanzanite ring which she treasured with everything the minute she received it so after their dinner at the Chinese restaurant, the family would go back to their home where they would enjoy some cake, some birthday cake and a cup of tea. Little did they know it would be the last time that they are all under one roof. The next day, Friday the 9th of July 2004, Lee had woken up. It was a Friday. Um, she had woken up to, you know, start her day. It was a normal, normal day. 
she was dressed kind of warm because that time of the year does get a bit chilly it's july so it's like winterish so she had her jacket on and she grabbed her tanzanite ring which she kept in her back pocket she did not wear it on her ring because unfortunately in our country you try to do as much as possible to not get mugged now the plan for friday was for Lee to meet two of her friends, they would go to Benmore Shopping Centre. Now, Benmore Shopping Centre was very close to Bond University. Bond University was situated in Morningside in Johannesburg. And because of the closeness between the university and Benmore Shopping Centre, students would usually meet there, shop there. It was just the hub, the chill out place. So it was very convenient. Anyway, Lee was meant to meet her two friends so that they could get a gift for a third friend who was having a party that Friday night. But before her plans could even come to be, she realized that she had her mom's credit card on her. She decided to contact her mom and ask her if they could meet at Bond University in the parking lot so that she could return her mother's credit card. Fine, no problem. Sharon was like, I'll be there at 10. Now, as planned, Sharon arrives at Bond University. Okay, now just a little side note, Bond University had a card system. So if you were a student there, you produce your card, your student card, and you swipe it at the boom gate to check in basically, and you would be let in. So it was pretty secure. Okay, you couldn't just waltz in. So Sharon arrives at the arranged time, but for some reason, Lee is running late. Now, one student or one friend said that they had seen Lee walking towards the parking lot. And another friend said they had seen Lee walking towards the parking lot, but also talking to an unknown man. Anyway, Sharon gives it a few minutes, okay? Maybe she's held up in class. Maybe she's just chit-chatting to somebody before she gets there. You know, no big deal. So she waited for Lee. But now it's been 20 minutes. So her mom keeps trying Lee's cell phone several times without any answer. Where could Lee be and why is she not answering her mother's calls? And this is kind of where the story turns for the worst, unfortunately. Sharon calls one more time, trying Lee on her cell phone. And finally, Lee's phone is answered, but it is not Lee on the other side of the line. Instead, it is some strange, unknown man. Now, of course, Sharon is like, okay, who is this? And why is this person answering Lee's phone? Very calmly, the man instructs Sharon to do as he says and informs her that he has taken Lee. Another instruction that Sharon was given was to not notify the police. Now, Sharon is brushing this off, okay? She's thinking it's a prank. She's probably assuming that, oh, it's Lee's friends kind of, you know, teasing her because, as everybody knows, in Pirates of the Caribbean, Elizabeth, the female character, gets abducted so could this be like a trailer or a teaser for what's to come on saturday night sharon again asked to speak to lee the strange man is very clear and tells sharon once again that he has taken lee and that she has to follow his every instruction and it dawns on sharon very quickly what is going on sharon becomes absolutely hysterical this is a nightmare she immediately calls rob's it's a friday morning and rob is at work actually he almost did not answer sharon's call sharon relayed what had just happened and rob acted immediately he called lee's phone the abductor response. The abductor then tells Rob that he requires 300,000 rand in exchange for Lee's life. Of course, Rob is like, 
you know what he will do anything for his daughter he acts immediately and visits three different banks three different bank branches to obtain this 300,000 rand which he managed to cook up I was willing to do anything because the abductor did make it very clear that if they do not listen to what he says or if they involve the police he will not hesitate to kill Lee so as a parent you can imagine you will go through anything you will do anything to make sure that your child makes it out alive but while all of this is happening while Rob is driving around frantically to you know get all this money he happened to contact a private investigator during this whole thing they managed to meet at a local petrol station together with a police captain Dion Skiapis so when the gentleman met the private investigator advised Rob to offer 50,000 Rand instead, not the full 300,000 Rand. Now, also during this time, Rob was back and forth with the abductor as well. Now, when Rob and the abductor were on the phone again, this is when Rob had negotiated to offer 50,000 Rand instead of the initial amount of 300,000. Surprisingly, the abductor agreed, which is still, I mean, I've read through the story. It's absolutely mind-boggling that he accepted 50,000 rand because that is a massive decrease from 300,000 to 50,000 rand. He concluded that he probably accepted because he probably was not very experienced in kidnapping or he was just very very desperate for this money it was arranged between rob and the abductor that they would meet at the r558 off ramp near grasmere toll plaza at 8 pm that night and the plan on rob's end was that a policeman would be in the car with rob so off Rob goes to the decided drop-off point. He was absolutely nervous. He was wrecked. And understandably so, can you imagine? He was so fearful that he asked the policeman to get out of the car because he feared that if he gets there and the abductor learns that there is a policeman in his car, he is going to kill Lee. So he was being super, super cautious. Okay. He dropped the policeman off and the policeman respected his wishes. Rob continues on his journey to this off-ramp drop-off zone. Again, he was so panicked, so, so nervous that he drove past the decided drop-off zone. The minute Rob drove past the drop-off zone, the abductor called almost immediately. So obviously he was being watched. The abductor went off 0 to 100 in a split second. He swore at Rob so badly and demanded that he make a U-turn and drop off this money. And that's exactly what Rob did. Finally, Rob had made it and he flashed his headlights three times as per their decided signal. Now, what I forgot to mention towards the beginning of the story is that he had actually spoken to them. Okay, she was obviously crying over the phone, you know, during the times that they were back and forth. She was crying over the phone. She reiterated what the abductor said to not involve the police and just get that money to this person as quick as possible. And she assured them that she was not harmed. That gave them hope and that made them work towards getting this money as quickly as possible. After Rob flashed his lights three times, the abductor approached the car knocking on his back window. 
rob then threw the money that was in a brown envelope out of the passenger window once the kidnapper collected the money he instructed rob to drive off immediately so rob did as he was told and as he drove off he was expecting a call from the abductor any second to let him know where he could pick lee up from but unfortunately this call would never come rob called back several times trying after every few minutes to try get a hold of this man that had abducted his daughter but unfortunately there was just no answer now this case was absolutely huge back in 2004 south africa was completely completely obsessed case i just could not shake it off that easily it's just so traumatic in every sense of the word now that there was no sign of the abductor or the abductor not letting the family know where they could collect lee a task force was formed a task force of 10 to 15 police officers were formed including private investigators and negotiators fast forward to saturday night the night which was supposed to be lee's 21st birthday bash instead of celebrating the parents were holding conferences begging anyone with any information to let them know where they could find lee and begging the abductor to return their daughter can you imagine how disappointing how dreadful it is to hold up your side of the bargain and not get anything in return like i would be livid and this was this family's reality and rob grew very agitated very quickly at first his approach was filled with humility just begging and wanting answers but then it turned into annoyance he said something along the lines of surely even bad people have some good in their hearts and surely the abductor can now finally release lee why is he keeping lee if he's got his money now this case escalated so quickly that the task force grew from 15 police officers to a hundred and 50 and this was because the tip line was exploding police force had like a hub a meeting point where they would all work you know like how you see in movies where there's the phone lines and they're waiting for a call and there's all this equipment and stuff like that it was that kind of vibe they even went as far as triangulating lee's phone and all just led to nothing but finally, on the 21st of July, 2004, a farm worker by the name of Elliot Makubela had come across something that looked like a body of a white female. Now, according to Elliot, he said his son had actually come across this body. His son came running towards him in fear, saying that he had found a doll. But when Elliot inspected what his son had found, he realized that it was actually a dead body. He ran to the nearest pub to alert anybody who would listen because usually police officers would frequent at the surrounding pubs in Walkerville. Now, for some weird reason, according to Elliot, at first the police didn't believe him, which is wild to me. But thankfully, they acted quick enough and finally believed him. And when they had inspected the body themselves, when investigators had come across the news that a body was found, it was confirmed that it belonged to Lee Matthews. He had been shot four times. Despite being found on the 21st of July, when she had disappeared on the 9th, her body was fairly clean and was only in the early decomposition stages. They had also found four bullet cartridges neatly placed in between her legs. Lee's body was weirdly clean, like it was just way 
way too clean. Kind of like it was staged. There was no blood anywhere. And of course there would be blood if you were shot four times. So obviously she was not killed where she was found. This case had quickly turned into a murder investigation. The police worked 24-7, like literally non-stop, but came up with nothing. Because of this, it was decided that they must hand this case over to Pete Bailefeld. As I said in the beginning, Pete is absolutely phenomenal. He was called to handle crimes. He was very, very well known. Pete said he hated crime with a passion and that is why he worked so hard and studied cases so intensely to see what everyone couldn't see. So on the 24th of August 2004 was when Pete would hop onto the bandwagon. Now the thing about everybody else is that they were looking out there in Walkerville. But Pete decided to start at the beginning, back at Bond University. Of course, as an investigator, you have to be in contact with the victim's families to gain some information about the victim. Pete would speak to her family to kind of get a sense of who she was and how this could have led to murder. The family notified and emphasized about how safety conscious Lee was. So Pete concluded that it had to be somebody that she knew. And a very, very little detail helped this case in a major, major way. So remember when Rob was so frantic and nervous that he drove past the drop-off zone and the abductor started like cursing at him and shouting at him? Well, Rob told Pete that when the abductor lost his marbles, his accent changed and his accent sounded like that of an Indian man. This totally contradicts what the abductor had first said about himself, which was that he was Libyan. So Pete took that little detail and ran with it. He visited Bond University and asked for the records of all the check-ins that were done from the students on that day. And he narrowed it down to those of Indian descent. One student stuck out to him like a sore thumb. The student was named Donovan Mudley. Donovan was older than the average student. Now something that Pete decided to do, you know, obviously knowing this from his experience, was that he said that usually suspects would, you know, hide out somewhere if a particular area is crawling with police. So he decided to check out the surrounding hotels, see if he finds anything. And he just did it, you know, just, on a hunch and it was a jackpot. He found out that Donovan had booked into a nearby Formula One hotel using his real name, his real ID number, his real vehicle registration, as well as his real credit card details. This information, Pete was able to find out anything and everything about Donovan. Now, Donovan looked like an ordinary guy. He seemed very pleasant. He dressed very well. So you wouldn't kind of like suspect him to be anybody dodge. He lived in Randburg and he genuinely had nice parents. His father was a minister and his mom was just a supportive wife who loved volunteering at church. He worked in finance for three years but was fired for fraud but he had told people that he actually left the job but that was not the case he was also engaged at the time now donovan had booked into the formula one hotel from the 6th of july to the 9th of july 2004 now because he used a credit card 
he checked out his credit card history, he had made three large deposits. 17,000 Rand on the 15th of July, 14,000 Rand and 4,000 Rand on the 27th of July 2004. He also happened to own a Ducati motorcycle. Now, his motorcycle was in repairs and the repairs were worth 36,000 Rand. But somehow he managed to negotiate with the dealership and they allowed him to pay half that amount and his reason was that a deal had gone wrong weirdly enough days after lee's disappearance donovan had gone on a huge shopping spree coincidentally a month after lee's disappearance and murder donovan had taken his girlfriend and another couple to durban hired out a yacht and proposed to her on this romantic yacht ride. Now, what everybody didn't know, Pete had managed to find the suspect only after two weeks of his investigation, and he kept it to himself because he wanted to suss everything out before he announces the big news. Not only had he found his suspect, but he had found forensic evidence as well. And nobody knew for two whole weeks. Lee's car was found abandoned at some random park. And in the car was lotto tickets with fingerprints on them. Plus duct tape with fingerprints on them. The fingerprints were tested and matched Donovan. Finally, Donovan was placed under surveillance, but he wasn't arrested just yet because Pete felt deep down that he probably had accomplices because the way the crime scene was set up, something just did not make sense. First of all, Lee's body had freezer burn on her hand and her foot which indicates that she was left somewhere very, very cold. For example, like a fridge. And conveniently, one of Donovan's friends owned a mortuary, but no evidence of Lee being there was found. So this didn't prove anything. On the 4th of October, 2004, Donovan was arrested. They camped outside his house, waiting for him to come out, and eventually he did. He was on the way to the gym. Pete stopped him in his tracks and put him under arrest. Donovan had the audacity to look at Pete and say, oh, I was expecting you. What took you so long? Now you see, because this case was all over the news, Donovan was keeping tabs. And when he heard that Pete Bailefeld was handed this case, even he knew that he did not have much time left. And according to Pete, when he was arrested, Donovan was shaking like a leaf. So much so that he confessed almost immediately. Now, Pete did this thing where he would drive around with his suspects, you know, trying to form like a trust between them. And he would drive them around trying to get information out of them. So he had taken Donovan to his parents' house and at his parents' house was where they would retrieve the gun that he used to kill Lee. And another thing that they found, Lee's tanzanite ring, the ring that she valued in his CD case. And he had gone back to the crime scene after he burned their clothes, you know, to get rid of evidence. He had gone back to get the ring because he discovered that she had it on her via the news. Donovan's mom was absolutely gutted and hurt because this was a case they were also following and she prayed for the family and that they would find the perpetrator only for the perpetrator to be her own son. Like, can you imagine? And like Donovan's parents were genuinely, genuinely good, nice, warm people so they were absolutely devastated as well and you know what's the most 
the most devastating thing about this case is the fact that okay the family is going through enough they've lost their child and people had the audacity to blame the family for lee's death like people would say things like oh maybe if you paid the three hundred thousand rand lee would have still been alive and that is such rubbish lee first of all lee did not die because of what her parents did or did not do no lee died because she was at the hands of a greedy selfish murderous man end of story lee was shot behind her left ear on her head and two shots in her chest and it was determined that she was sitting down at the time that she was shot and a spider's web played a major role in confirming that lee was not in that field since the day that she was killed because if so that spider's web would have broken and there were like almost like no insects around her body and according to elliot he's always in that field collecting grass for thatch roofs and he definitely did not see a body the day before 2005 donovan pled guilty on all charges his trial only lasted two days and he was sentenced to life in prison it was also confirmed that donovan's movements matched lee's cell phone movements and possibly lee herself donovan made several calls to his friends before and after the kidnapping and the most called number on Donovan's track record belongs to a very close friend of his. The number belonging to this friend that he called most of the time was traced to be at the drop-off zone at the very same time that Rob was there. So Pete concluded that there has to be others. Donovan tried to obtain a retrial and an appeal, but this was denied to him. Donovan's parents were so compassionate and definitely did not condone his behavior. So much so that Donovan's dad and Lee's dad were able to shake hands because Donovan's parents believe that whatever punishment is due to him, he will have to endure because what he did was totally unacceptable and they don't even understand why because if he needed money, he could have just asked his parents. He did not come from a poor family. Donovan's parents were also well off, so this problem could have been solvable. He didn't have to kill someone for no reason. And because of him, a family will never see their daughter again. And that, my friends, is the Lee Matthews case. Let me know what you think about this case. Had you heard about it before? Say hi in the comment section and let's discuss this very, very tragic case case definitely just hits my heart like no other such an unnecessary death someone who added more sunshine to the world was lost her family will never get to see her smile again it's just absolutely absolutely awful anyway guys with that being said don't forget to hit the like button if you did enjoy and comment your thoughts love to hear from you. I will see you in my next video.